Have you ever heard of an insecure direct object reference, also known as an IDOR? If not, or if you want to learn more about them, then today you're in for a treat. In today's video, I'm going to show you just how easy it is for an attacker to exploit and gain access to sensitive information using IDORs uh, on ports for your academy. But don't worry, I'm also going to show you inside of Let's Defend how to investigate an IDOR. So if you're ready, let's get started. So hopping into IDORs, um, what is an IDOR? I would highly suggest that you check out uh, Port Swiggers Academy. They have a ton of really great content and uh, it's, a, it's a great resource if you want to learn more about web vulnerabilities, especially how to exploit those, how to secure your environment against them and use Burp Suite along the way, which is their product. Um, so on the IDOR page, it'll give you an overview of what it is. I'll sum it up for you pretty quickly. Inside of databases, generally, uh, you can reference an object inside that database directly. Um, so here we have an example of a website that is looking up a customer number and it's providing you the actual number, the, the object inside of the database. And that would be a direct reference to that object. Doesn't necessarily mean that it's insecure, so we're missing the I from IDOR at this point. Now what would make it insecure is if we pair that direct object reference with an access control vulnerability, meaning that maybe my customer account number is 132355, but I should not be able to see the next customer above or the next customer below me inside of that database. Um, so I should not be able to pull up customer number 132356 because that's not me. Now, if that object is not being controlled, the access control of that object is not sufficient, and I can access those, then I might be able to gain access to sensitive data that I shouldn't have access to. That is, in a nutshell, what an IDOR is. They're pretty common to find, um, in my experience, inside bug bounty and things like that. Um, it, it's an easy mistake to make for uh, developers they're not always extremely obvious because it may be happening underneath the hood um, inside of API calls and things like that. You may not always see it inside of a URL, but they are, they are somewhat common uh, vulnerability, which is also why they've ended up inside of the OWASP top 10 a few times. So at the bottom of the page, we can actually open up a lab. I wanna show you how an IDOR works before we hop into Let's Defend and take a look at the uh, alert that comes in for a potential IDOR. That way you understand what the attacker is trying to achieve and maybe how to better investigate that alarm. So let's go ahead and click access the lab. And then I'm going to actually do it inside of Burp Suite. So if you don't have Burp Suite, I recommend you install it you can get community or pro, pro costs money, community's free. And so I have my Burp Suite browser open. I'm gonna go ahead and grab my custom link from the Academy from Port Swigger. Let's go to that. Okay, so here we are inside of the lab. Now we need to find a an object reference that could be insecure to give us access to something. On the lab description, it will tell us what our object or the objective of this is. So chat logs directly on the file systems, retrieve them using static URLs, find the password for the user Carlos. So that's our objective. So let's look, just as an example, let's look at one of these items. So here we have an item from their web store and we can see that it's being called by the product ID. So this dancing in the dark item is product ID number two. Here is an example of a direct object reference that isn't necessarily insecure. It's just, it's the door without the eye. So if we put this back in to, uh, we, we modify the parameter from two to three, we hit enter. Now we're on the giant enter key didn't reveal anything to us that we didn't already know. You know, if you're, if you're back here on the homepage, you can see the giant enter key. They didn't tell us any secrets here. Now you could go down here and you say, okay, well, the last item in the list here is item number 20. 
we might be able to see if there's an unlisted item available to us. There's not, it wasn't found. So that's just an example of a regular direct object reference um, without kind of the insecure piece. Based off the fact that they said there's chat logs, I'm guessing we need to go to live chat and let's send something through. Okay, so they've responded. Now, if we wanna view the transcript, it sounds like this is the way to go. Inside of Burp Suite, I'm gonna turn intercept on. That way we can modify the requests and responses that are coming through. I select view transcript, go back to Burp Suite. And so I am tracking WebSockets along with responses. By default, Burp Suite will not do that. You'll only see your requests. So here's our request. We've posted, uh, sent a post request that we wanna download our transcript. That's an example of our transcript. You should probably see a get, and there it is. Okay, so we have get backslash download dash transcript to dot text. So we are not the first log to be created here. So let's modify that and make it one dot text and then forward, or you can just turn intercept off. Let's go ahead and do that. That forwarded our request and we got one dot text. Shows I got two dot text. Mess that up. Let's do this again. Intercept on, view transcript, forward. One, let's just do forward instead of turning it off. Ah, uh, it sent it to through twice. That's where we messed up. Okay. So we're going to do it again. Forward. We can turn intercept off at this point. And we have one dot text. And in here we can see. This is not our conversation. And so this must be Carlos. Um, so we have the password for Carlos. We can copy that. We could go to my account. Put in Carlos and the password. And voila, we have solved the lab. So that's an example of how an IDOR works. Um, how often is it that you're going to download chat logs? It could happen. Um, most of the time, it's as simple as you get logged into an account and it might be like account backslash one and then you would just increment that or de-increment it as needed and you could see other people's accounts. Um, you might be able to see configuration items, all sorts of crazy stuff um, that I found. But keep an eye out as you're working through applications and start looking for those things. Um, it, you'll be surprised how often you see direct object references. Like I said at the top, remember that just because you see a direct object reference doesn't mean it's an insecure direct object reference. You have to pair that with an access control vulnerability to make it insecure. So with that, let's go ahead and hop into Let's Defend and investigate alarm that's come in there. All right, so here we are inside the Let's Defend platform. We've got the rule SOC 169, possible IDOR attack detected, um, has gone ahead and, and gotten kicked off. I went ahead and grabbed that one. So we can look at the details here. Um, host name, web server 1005. We have our destination IP address, which is the IP for web server 1005. We have our source IP address. We see that it was a post method and it was get user info. So that's interesting. Um, consecutive request to the same page is the reason for this and the device action was allowed, assuming that means that it came through the firewall. So we'll probably really just focus on log management. Um, this isn't some, an IDOR is gonna happen on a web server at the, at the web server level. It's not something that you would generally see anything on like endpoint security inside of like an EDR or anything like that. Um, so we can create a case for that. Continue. All right. And so from here, let's go back to monitoring. Let's look for our attacker's IP address inside of log management. So filter, uh, source address is our bad guy. So here we have a number of requests, all pretty in, in, in sequential order here um, in quick sequence. So starting out, we see a request for user ID one. We got a 200 status code, 200 is okay, meaning it was successful. 
and the response size was 188. So let's look at the next request. Indeed, they incremented, looked for user ID two, got a success, and the response size was different. Let's continue on and see if this pattern continues. It indeed does. Three, 200, 351. Now, we'll look through the other two here as well, but what I'm getting from this and the fact that the response sizes are different is I'm guessing that the user information is different, which means when the web server is responding back to the attacker, they're getting a different response size because John Smith's you you know user profile information may be less than Billy Bob Joe, and the very least, Billy Bob Joe's name is longer than John Smith's name is. So that's where you're going to start seeing these response size differences, which indicates to me that the attack was successful. Again, we see a different response size, different user ID, success, and finally, same thing. So it does look like the attack was successful. Let's grab that IP address again. Let's go to virus total and let's just see if there's any information on it. It is flagged as a malicious IP address and it's in DigitalOcean. So if you're not familiar, DigitalOcean is a virtual hosting provider. Um, very common for individuals to use that for like bug bounty or even for malicious purposes if they're out there looking to compromise web servers, um, such as it looks like in this case. I'll take a look here. Um, so this company Poison Eye looks like they had some honeypots out there and they indeed did it try to attack some of the honeypots? So, you know, I mean, it's digital ocean. Is this necessarily the same person that was trying to log into honeypots? Maybe, maybe not. Um, February of 2022, this was a year ago. It doesn't say exactly when does it, uh, March. Um, you know, it, it could be the exact same group that is attempting to just exploit anything they can find on the internet. I don't know if that's necessarily the case or not. So one other thing that you would want to check as a SOC analyst, um, let's check our mailbox and see if we have anything from, no, we do not. Um, looking that up to see if we had an indication from somebody inside of our organization saying, hey, we're gonna be conducting pen testing, we're gonna use DigitalOcean, and maybe it was just a coincidence that the same IP address that's flagged in virus total happened to be where the pen testers were coming from. That doesn't look like that's the case. Um, so if we go back to the investigation, I feel like we've, we're probably okay to actually go ahead and f do the playbook here. So let's start the playbook. We understand why the alert was triggered. They were requesting sequentially different user IDs that that's what triggered this. Um, Collect the data, ownership, yep, we know DigitalOcean. It is coming from the outside. Ownership, static or pool ID, yep, okay. Uh, reputation, we've already looked at that. Yep. Is it who owns the device and last user log on time? I mean, might be relevant um, in terms of like, if you have to escalate this to a higher tier inside the SOC or something like that, but I mean, if you have an attacker coming in from the internet who's been logged into the device isn't really super relevant to me. So examine the HTTP traffic. We've done that. We looked inside the logs um, to see what was going on inside of the um, web attacks on it. Let's defend.io. You could look at IDOR. I assume they have something in there about that, um, being that they have it listed here. I like Port Swigger. I like the hands-on aspect to it. Um, I have not gone through Let's Defend's Web Attack 101. So is this malicious? I'm gonna go yes. We know it was an IDOR. We do not believe this was planned. We don't have any emails about it. It was source to destination was internet to company network. Was the attack successful? Yes, we believe so. If yes, uh, if no, 
containment. Yes, we're going to need to go back to endpoint security. Can we do that? Yes. Let's go web server 1005. Request containment. So we're going to contain it. And you could come in here and look at network connections. It's not going to have an active connection. It was a request. Command history, you're not going to see anything in there. Browser history, you're not going to see anything in there. And it's not going to spawn a process. That's why I say looking at the EDR for like a web attack is pretty irrelevant. You really need to be focused on the logs at that point um, until you see that it's escalated. If it led to something different, if your investigation leads you there, then follow that. But in this case, it's pretty straightforward. Okay, so we requested containment. What are our artifacts? We have just a P. That's pretty much it. I don't have anything else here. Um, there's no URL, no emails, no MD5 hashes. It's pretty much just that. Um, should we perform tier two escalation? Yes, because we don't know what the impact of this was. I can't tell you exactly what that attacker saw. Um, if that user profile that was being uploaded or the user information that was being requested um, had sensitive data inside of it, absolutely this needs to be escalated. Um, so yeah, we're gonna go ahead and escalate it. So inside of here, you know, I would basically explain everything that we just did. I'm not gonna make you watch me type that all out. I'm just gonna do blah, blah, blah. Um, but I would do that. And then I would also consider putting in there some remediation guidance. Now, of course, your tier two, ideally, if you're a tier one analyst, your tier two analyst should already know those types of things and they should pass that along um, to the asset owner or, you know, the system owner who's responsible for that web application. But uh, I, I would include that in here as well. Finish the playbook, done. All right, so we've done that. We're gonna close the alert. I'm going to say it's a true positive. Again, I'm not going to make you watch me write notes. We're going to go blah, blah, blah. Close the alert. Yay, I gained a new badge. Cool. Oh, no. What do we get? All right. So let's see. Correct answer. That's good. Yay. All right. So we found that the answer was that it was a true positive. We did need to escalate to tier two. The attack was successful. We got the direction of the traffic internet to internal, correct. It was not a planned test because we didn't have any emails about it. It was an IDOR and it was malicious traffic. So hopefully after watching how an attacker finds these things, how they can use them to exploit it and um, how to defend against it, how to, how to detect that and do an investigation on that, you feel more comfortable with the concept of an IDOR from both sides. Hope you enjoyed. Thanks.